Hello, my name is Adrian Gowdy and today we're going to discuss ultrasound principles and physics. It's important for you to understand these so that you can get the best images possible out of your machines and to correctly interpret those images that you then produce. Following this will be a talk on ultrasound artefacts where you'll see the problems that these principles can cause if you don't understand them. Now, before we begin to discuss any of the details, I just want to point out that on some of the slides you'll notice there's a symbol of a target and arrow. We've used this symbol to indicate what we consider the most fundamental and important principles. So please pay close attention to these slides because this will contain the information that you really need to understand to properly use the ultrasound machine and also the information may will turn up in your exam at the end. So at its most basic level, how does an ultrasound machine work? Well, a pulse of sound is sent out by a transducer, it hits an object, and then it bounces back. We can see this, here is a transducer, here is our object, we send out a sound wave, travels through the media until it hits the object, it then reflects back from the object and comes back to the transducer. The time it takes for the return echo is dependent on the distance to the object and back. And assuming the wave velocity is constant, if we know that time and we know the velocity, then we can calculate the distance between the transducer and the object. If we have a screen, we can then put a blip on the screen to mark out that distance. So here we have the transducer, here we have the object, and here we have our screen. We send out a sound wave, it travels through the medium, it hits the object, a reflection is generated, but most of the energy continues on until it hits the far end of the object, another reflection is generated, and then these two reflections travel back to the transducer. When the first reflection hits the transducer, the machine puts a blip on the screen. A short time later, the second reflection hits the transducer, the machine puts another blip on the screen, this time a little further down because it knows that it's taken a little bit longer. The strength of the returning signal depends on a few factors. The strength of the original pulse, how much energy is lost travelling to the object, how much energy is reflected at that interface, and then how much energy is lost travelling back. Now, as sound waves travel through tissue, they dissipate energy and some of the energy is absorbed by the tissue. And this we refer to as attenuation. And as a result, the further the sound wave has to travel, the greater the amount of energy that is lost to attenuation. Different amounts of energy are lost according to the type of tissue. So for example, fluid, has very low attenuation, it doesn't absorb much energy at all. Fat, on the other hand, has high attenuation, and bone has very high attenuation. Now there's also a very important principle here, we've highlighted it in yellow, and this is one of the most fundamental elements of understanding ultrasound machines. The attenuation that an ultrasound pulse undergoes depends not only on the tissue, but also on the frequency of the ultrasound pulse. The higher the frequency, the greater the attenuation. This is important because the higher the attenuation, the less energy will get back to the transducer, and therefore your effective range of your ultrasound machine is much less. And we'll talk about this again and again, the relationship between frequency and the penetration of your machine. Now we've already mentioned that reflections occur at interfaces. The proportion of sound that is reflected depends on the difference between what's called the acoustic impedance of the tissues and that's the intrinsic property of one of the different types of tissues. In general at most interfaces within the body, 
most of the energy is transmitted. This is very useful for us because we can see the front of objects and the back of objects and beyond interfaces deeper into the tissues. However, at certain interfaces, such as air and tissue, the acoustic impedance is so different that the vast majority of energy is reflected and not transmitted. At air tissue interfaces, over 99% of the energy is reflected, and that's why you can't see through gas with ultrasound. Now, getting back to how our machine works, when it receives the blip coming back, it can work out the strength of that returning signal, and it adjusts the brightness of the blip that it puts on the screen based on that. So, putting that all together, what have we got so far? Well, the transducer emits a pulse of sound along this particular direction, which we call the beam line. The pulse travels through the tissue, it loses energy as it goes. It hits an object where some of the energy is reflected, but most continues on. That reflected energy travels back through the tissue, undergoing attenuation again, until it gets back to the transducer. When it gets to the transducer, the transducer converts that energy into an electrical signal, which is processed to produce a blip on the screen. The position of the blip depends on the time taken, and the brightness of the blip depends on the strength of the returning impulse. And essentially, that is M-mode ultrasound, where you have a single beam line, and the result of the returning echoes is plotted against time. Here's an example. This is an M-mode ultrasound at the bottom here. And what we see here, we can see where the beam direction is. Every time it's hit an interface, we've got a mark on the screen. And this scrolls over time. But if we get a little bit more complicated, we can add more beam lines in different directions. And if we use multiple beam lines and plot each one, on the screen, based on the direction that it was sent out in, we can actually build up a two-dimensional image. And if we do that repeatedly and we do it fast enough, you can actually watch things change in real time. And this is what's called B-mode ultrasound. Here we have a transducer, we send out beams, multiple directions. Every time it hits an interface, it produces a blip. So we have a blip here, blip here, here, here. And so on our screen, what we get is an outline of the object. Obviously, the more beam lines we have, the more accurate this is going to look. Now, the machines themselves are very clever. We've already spoken about attenuation and said that the tissue absorbs and dissipates a certain amount of energy. Well, the machine actually knows this. And so it builds in an amplification factor based on the depth. It knows the depth from the returning signal time. And the result of this is that a uniform tissue should appear uniform in the image. So here we have a graphical representation and what this just means is that a blip that returns very quickly only has a small amount of amplification. A blip that takes a long while to return, the machine amplifies a great deal more to balance that attenuation. So, going into a little bit more detail on exactly how the machine works. A pulse is generated by what's called the piezoelectric effect. An electrical pulse is applied across a crystal and it makes the crystal vibrate. The vibrations create the ultrasound wave. And similarly, in the reverse effect, when an ultrasound pulse hits a, the crystal in the transducer, it vibrates and the crystal creates an electrical pulse. Now, this is the point where we have to go back and revisit some of our high school physics. Try not to get too scared, I know it was a little while ago, but nevertheless, most of it's still fairly simple. If you recall, sound is a mechanical wave with areas of alternating high and low pressure, and these are called compression and rarefaction zones. Here we have a reflection, here we see the areas of higher pressure and here of lower pressure. And we usually 
represent that as a sine wave based on the energy or the distance that the molecules are moved from their mean resting position. Now if we plot that against time, so here we have the movement of a single molecule, then the distance that it moves is referred to as the amplitude. The time taken for it to undergo one complete movement is called the period or the cycle. Now, in this slide, we have a graph that looks very similar, but is actually a bit different. Here we are not plotting the movement of a single molecule over time. Here what we have is a snapshot at a given time where we plot all the molecules movement at that time. And so once again we have the amplitude which is going to be the same of course, but the distance between two successive molecules in a cycle is known as the wavelength. And so here what we're plotting against is amplitude against distance, whereas in the previous graph we were plotting amplitude against time and we had the period. Now of course there's a relationship between these two things. The frequency is defined as the inverse of the period. And this is one of the most fundamental relationships in ultrasound physics, and that is the velocity is the product of the wavelength and the frequency, and the velocity is constant in a given tissue. What does that mean? Well, the thing that you must remember is that as frequency increases, therefore, the wavelength will decrease. The two are inversely related. In addition, ultrasound waves have all the properties of all other waves. And if again you cast your mind back to high school physics, you'll remember that all waves undergo reflection, refraction, diffraction, interference and dispersion. Now fortunately, we don't have to worry about most of these. We're going to talk about reflection and refraction. Diffraction really isn't an issue in ultrasound physics. Interference and dispersion we can leave till later on. So, we've already mentioned reflection multiple times so far. But there are a few subtler points about the types of reflectors. In general, we can classify them into large or small. Large reflectors generally reflect back the whole wave front, and that's called specular reflection, whereas small reflectors will actually act like point sources, and this is called scattered reflection. What do I mean by that? Well, if here we have a large object, here is a sound wave or an energy wave travelling towards it, it hits the object and it gets reflected back. On the other hand, if here we have a very small reflector, sound wave travels towards it, hits the object, if we look at the shape of the reflection here, it acts as though it came from this single point source. So why is this important? Well, small reflectors and those with irregular surfaces give rise to wave fronts heading in all directions. These interfere with each other and give rise to the echo texture that we see in organs. If we look at this image of the left lobe of a liver, what we can see is on the surface here we have the large right reflection of the specular reflection. From the liver itself we have echo texture which is being generated by multiple small anatomical structures creating wave fronts spreading out and interfering with each other. Why is, does this matter? Well what we can say is the specular reflection accurately reflects an interface that is there at that position. Whereas all the little dots that go to create the echo texture, each little dot doesn't actually represent an anatomical structure because the dots in here are due to the interference of all these multiple wave fronts coming back from all the scattered reflection. 
Now, we need to talk about resolution because we need to understand how accurate our machine is in finding precise objects and surfaces and in particular looking for very small structures. When we talk about resolution, we talk about axial resolution, that is the resolution along the line of the beam. And the primary determinant of axial resolution is the pulse length. And this is determined mainly by the wavelength or the frequency. As we've said before, they're inversely related, so when we talk about one, we're automatically talking about the other. There are some other characteristics that are important. The particular characteristics of the transducer, what are referred to as the bandwidth and the damping, and also the amplitude of the driving voltage pulse, but you don't need to worry about this level of detail. In general, with the frequencies and the machines that we use normally, our axial resolution is between 0.3 and 1.2 millimetres. So how does the frequency affect the resolution? Well, a typical ultrasound pulse has, for example, three cycles of wave energy. If this is high frequency, we can see a reflection here of the, of the pulse. Just look at the length of that compared to a three cycle pulse for a low frequency impulse. Because it's a lower frequency, it's got a longer wavelength and therefore the pulse itself is longer. Why does that matter? Well, here for example, on the left hand side, let's look at a situation where we have two objects that are further apart than the length of our pulse. The pulse comes down, it hits the first object, there's a reflection, most of the energy continues on, it's the second object, there's a second reflection, we have then two reflections that come back, hit the transducer, one after each other, and we get two blips put on the screen. Now, let's have a look and see what happens when our pulse length is longer than the distance between the two objects. The front of that pulse hits the first object, there is a reflection that is generated as the pulse passes through, and then the pulse hits the second object. There is again another reflection, but the reflection from this second object, as it comes back, the front of that reflection will actually run into the back of the reflection from the first object. So as a result, we only get a single pulse returning to the transducer. It's much longer, and I've indicated this on the screen by putting an elongated diamond here. But in actual fact, the machine will not do this. The machine will put the blip on the screen from the time it first receives that impulse. So there will only be a single blip put on the screen. In other words, the machine is unable to resolve these two objects as being separate objects because the pulse length is greater than the distance between them. Now if we talk about lateral resolution, that is resolution perpendicular to the direction of the beam, the primary determinant of that is what's called the beam width. And we'll talk about this in a moment. There are some other factors, line density and field of view, but don't worry about those. In general, the lateral resolution is one to three millimeters on most of the machines we're using at the moment. In other words, it's not as good as the axial resolution. And that's important if you're trying to do very precise measurements. Fortunately for us, for most of the things we're doing, we don't need to be quite that accurate. So what determines the beam width? Well, there's a number of factors, but really the two that you need to can be concerned with are what's called the focus and the distance from the transducer. Okay, don't, you don't need to worry about the other factors that are listed there. So, why is this, how does this affect the resolution? Well, if we look at the shape of the ultrasound beam, and when we say this, what we're actually doing is pointing out where the energy path travels. It actually has a finite width. We normally tend to think about it as being an infinitely narrow beam, but in fact it's not. It actually has a particular width. And 
the width of the transducer is the width of the transducer. It is actually focused, just like a light beam can be. And so it comes down to its narrowest point, and that's called the focal point. And then beyond that, it widens and diverges. So an object that you're trying to image down at this depth, the lateral resolution here is much worse than it is here. Now the other thing you'll notice on this diagram are these things called side lobes. These are areas of energy that are generated by the transducer and they're created because of the way the crystal matrix is formed within the transducer. And so some of the energy spills out to the side. Most of it will travel down the beam, but some spills out to the side. And this is one of the causes of artefacts, and you'll hear about this more in the next talk. So, putting it all together, what does this mean? Well, it's very important and this is why we've emphasised this relationship between attenuation and frequency and resolution and frequency. If you want penetration, you need to choose low frequency. So, I've heard people say so much of anything is not good for you. Okay, a very short clip from Barry White. Just to help you mem remember, if you were trying to ultrasound Barry White, he's a very large guy, you're going to need a lot of penetration, so you need low frequency. Just remember, he sings at a very low frequency, and then you should remember what probe and what frequency you want. On the other hand, if you want resolution, then you need to go for a high frequency. You should set your focus where you want your best resolution or just behind. Now some of the machines have an automatic focus but if you've got the option choose to where you're going to put your focus. And you can minimize your scanning field of view. That's the actual width of the arc that you cover with your machine. Some machines will allow you to adjust that and that will also help your resolution. We'll talk about this again and we'll demonstrate all this in the practical sessions on how to do your scanning. Okay, moving on from this we're now going to talk about the Doppler effect because this is how we pick up flows and movement with ultrasound. So as you recall once again back to high school physics, a wave that hits a moving reflector will have its frequency either increased or decreased depending on whether that reflector is moving towards or away from the object. If you think about an ambulance siren, comes in high pitch as it comes towards you, drops its pitch as it passes. The machine understands all this and so it can actually measure the change in frequency and be, that has resulted from the Doppler effect and it can calculate the movement of those reflecting surfaces. Now within the body that generally means blood flow. There are a few specific indications in echocardiography where we actually look at tissue movement but generally we use this in the body for blood flow. But because the machine can't necessarily determine whether the moving reflector was tissue or blood flow we can actually get artefacts from this and you'll see this when you're trying to put the colour on sometimes if you've got too much movement from other things, you just get a whole wash of colour that blurs everything out. Now, one of the things you need to remember is that it doesn't just measure movement in any direction. It actually measures the component of movement that occurs in the direction of the beam. What do I mean by this? Well, if the blood flow is almost in the same direction as the beam, there'll be lots of Doppler shifts. However, if the blood flow is exactly perpendicular to the direction of the beam, there will be no Doppler shift because even though the reflector is moving, there's none of that movement is in the same direction as the beam. And this is important because if you're trying to look for flow, you have to make sure that you're in the right direction because if your, for example, vessel is perpendicular to your beam, then you won't show any colour Doppler at all. 
even though there is flow through that vessel. Finally, we need to talk briefly about some of the safety issues with ultrasound. As we've mentioned right at the beginning, ultrasound waves interact with tissues through which they pass. Energy is dispersed into the tissue and therefore heat is generated. That is called the thermal effect. As the sound wave travels through tissue, the molecules in those tissues are moved and that's called the mechanical effects. Don't forget, ultrasound is not ionising radiation, so we don't have to worry about any of those issues. And finally, don't forget infection control. So thermal effects, as we said, are tissue heating effects. They're actually used therapeutically. The physiotherapists use therapeutic ultrasound with much, much higher energy than we use in diagnostic ultrasound. One of the things you need to remember is that hypothermia is teratogenic. This has been shown in a number of different animal species and appears to be uniform. It's never been tested scientifically in humans, but in all other species it's been shown to occur. Some ultrasound modes emit lots of sound energy to small areas of tissue, in particular pulse wave Doppler and continuous wave Doppler. Lots of energy down to a particular area and the beam isn't moving. Now on the other hand, grey scale two-dimensional ultrasound is a low energy mode and it also, because the beam sweeps back and forth, transmit energy across a wide area. The result is for 2D normal grayscale imaging, you really shouldn't get any tissue heating effects. But if you use the high powered modes and keep the beam on one particular point, then you need to be very mindful not to keep it there for a time that will generate temp high temperatures if you're talking about embryonic tissue. Mechanical effects, as we said, the molecules vibrate. And in particular, this has been shown to be relevant in tissues that contain gas. And high energy ultrasound waves have actually been shown to cause tissue damage in particular in the lung and in the gut because those tissues contain gas. And this is particularly the case in some of the newer machines which have very high output energies. And their outputs are in the range where these effects have been shown to occur. However, having said all of that, the good news is that no definite adverse clinical effect has ever been shown to occur from diagnostic ultrasound. Infection control is always an issue in hospitals and ultrasound is no different. Don't forget, gel can harbour bacteria and the crevices on probe surfaces can be particularly difficult to clean. I don't know whoever designed them, but the person who put lots of grooves, pits, holes, and lumps and bumps on them obviously never had to clean one once it had become particularly contaminated. And for us in emergency, don't forget that there may well be lots of body fluids around when you're asked to undertake and perform the ultrasound. So, how do we put all these issues together? What's the take home message? Scan for as short as possible, consistent with obtaining the necessary images. Don't dwell for too long on a single spot to avoid the thermal and mechanical effects. Avoid high energy modes to embryonic and fetal tissue. As we said, the 2D grayscale is fine but you really shouldn't be using the high energy Doppler modes. And always make sure you clean the probe after every use. And if it's, you think it's gonna be a problem, put a cover on it before you start. That's the end of this talk. The next talk will be on ultrasound artifacts where you'll see how the understanding of these principles is important
so that you don't misinterpret the images that the machine gives you. And during the practical sessions, you'll see how we use these principles to try and optimise the image that you get from the machine. Thank you very much.